because the photon adds energy and that energy can o overcome the activation barrier E sub A. So we talked a lot about this last time that the part, a large part of photochemistry is just simply activation. And it turns out that this activation can be selective because if you're using a species that absorbs at a specific wavelength, you're only exciting that species and not exciting the entire mixture or solution. The other part about photochemistry that I didn't talk as much about last time is related to thermodynamics. And we have the example of all the trees back behind you that the light can c help to overcome an unfavorable process. So if you're doing an endothermic process or a process that has a positive delta G, you can actually drive that reaction by adding energy. You can add that energy in a number of different ways and one way is through light. This is just a little bit of a review about photochemistry. And so now let's talk about photocatalysis. So let's just define a photocatalyst. This is a species that speeds or enhances the rate of a photo process. without changing itself. So this is just the same definition of a catalyst, except we put in one little special word, photoprocess. So same thing as a catalyst in most cases, except you've got this added requirement that you have to absorb a photon. Now the thing about photocatalysis is it pretty much follows the same concept of this one here that you're enhancing the kinetics by adding a energy to overcome a reaction barrier. But what gets a little bit complicated is we call this catalysis and catalysis is specifically talking about speeding the rate of a reaction. But there are actually unfavorable processes that can occur with photocatalysts. And that word is no longer accurate anymore because catalysis means it's speeding the rate. So it's actually overcoming the, um, the energy barriers in some cases. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So just to give a quick um, example, this is going to be a homogeneous photocatalyst. So just like with catalysts, we can have heterogeneous or homogeneous. Homogeneous being dissolved in the same phase, typically in solution and heterogeneous being typically a solid in a solution system or a liquid system. But I'm going to give one example of homogeneous photocatalysis, and this is actually something that we already talked about. So if we have this molecule, tetracine, and we add a photon, we can, I'm going to call this S for sensitizer. So we can get this excited singlet state because this molecule absorbs a photon, goes up to a higher energy level. But as you recall, this singlet state can then convert into a triplet state. And that triplet state can react readily with triplet oxygen to make singlet oxygen, which is also an excited state. And key point here, is I've drawn this as the molecule and I've used the symbol S to represent it. So you notice we start with the molecule, we end up with the molecule. So that's for catalysts, right? You end up un with the unchanged species. And then this singlet oxygen species can react with something else. I'll just put up anthracene as the example. And as I illustrated before, that oxygen can add to the aromatic system to make 
roughly that species, the endoperoxide, which then typically will react further to end up making anthroquinone or other products. And so if you add all this up, I didn't leave myself any room here, but if you add all this up, this species cancels here, right? The single it cancels here, the triplet cancels, and uh, the singlet oxygen cancels. So if you add all this up, what do you have is ground state oxygen reacting with the anthracene to give the product. So that's typically what catalysis looks like, right? You have a bunch of intermediates that aren't part of the overall reaction and your catalyst, this species, is unaffected by the reaction. So this is an example of homogeneous catalysis or as we called it earlier, indirect photolysis or sensitized photolysis. I'm not gonna talk very much more about homogeneous catalysis or photocatalysis because it's not a subject that's very uh, commonly um, talked about in aquatic systems, in natural aquatic systems. This kind of chemistry happens all the time. People don't really talk about it as photocatalysis, they just call it a indirect photolysis or sensitized photolysis. What we're gonna spend most of the time talking about is heterogeneous catalysis or photocatalysis because that is a subject area that a lot of people spend a lot of attention on. And the most common species that is found in catalysis, photocatalysis, is titanium dioxide. But before we get into that, I'm gonna focus my comments on environmental photocatalysis for two potential applications. One is for waste streams. So if there's a facility that's producing certain products and there's um, waste products, those waste products could be treated by photocatalysts. And the other area that I'm gonna talk about a little bit is environmental systems themselves. So if you have pollutants in the environment, you may want to remediate them, and photocatalysis is one mechanism that can be used. So like I said earlier, titanium dioxide is the most commonly discussed photocatalyst, and there's good reasons for that, and there's one bad reason for that. So TiO2, more specifically, Anatase, uh, titanium dioxide has three crystal structures, anatase, um, rutile, and brukite. And anatase is the best at photocatalysis as far as anyone can tell, although there's some debate about that. Uh, this is a tetragonal structure, and the other two structures, the rutile and brukite, are just not typically as good as being a photocatalyst. But TiO2 has a, a series of important properties. And I'm going to illustrate all of those properties. So we're going to use this little diagram here. This circle represents a particle of titanium dioxide. It could be a nanoscale particle, could be a microscale particle. Typically we want small particles because that gives us greater surface area and some other advantages. And this line down here represents, represents the valence band. So we're really superimposing an energy diagram across on top of this cartoon of a particle. So it's not a really a realistic drawing, but this is what people use. So uh, there's the valence band, that's the conduction band. And in the middle here is the band gap. So what we have, if you review orbital diagrams, when you put all these titanium atoms and the oxygen atoms all together in the lattice, their orbitals tend to overlap with each other. And so instead of getting um, uh, quantized orbitals like we talked about for molecules where we have the S0 and the S1 and the S2 and so on, in the solid state, all of those orbital level energy levels tend to overlap each other and blur together to give, instead of distinct levels, a band. So we get the valence band there, and that is populated with electrons. The electrons that are in this valence band are tightly held, or we could say they are localized. 
So even though we've got overlap of these orbitals across the atoms, these electrons in the valence band do not travel. They're basically stuck on the atoms where they originate. However, these conduction band orbitals, which are not populated in the ground state, these are mobile or delocalized. So this diagram here is for generically what we call a semiconductor. When it's in the ground state, all the electrons are in the valence band, they're tightly held, it's not a conductor. If you add energy and promote an electron up to the conduction band, then it becomes a conductor. And that's where the term semiconductor. Under some conditions it's conductor, on other conditions it's not. And again, this band gap is the difference between the top of the valence band and the bottom of the conduction band. And for TiO2, that gap is about 3.2 electron volts. It's dependent upon the what's around the surface because if you put things with different electron densities around that moves the energy states but typically it's around 3.2 electron volts and this corresponds to about 388 nanometers so what that means is if you irradiate this with 450 nanometer light that photon has maybe about that much energy is there a state here? Is there an energy level there? No. So that process cannot happen. There's no absorbance of that photon simply because there are no energy levels there. So anything longer than 388 nanometers, this is a little bit of a simplification, anything longer than 388 is not going to get absorbed. Anything shorter than 388 will get absorbed. So we could put a an arrow there and this photon would correspond to approximately 388 nanometers and if we do that process we have an electron now up in the valence band and we leave behind a vacancy here which we call hole and this is often called either an electron hole pair or it's called sometimes an exciton so that excited state has a lifetime, just like we talked about with molecular species. Once you get the excited state, it can relax back down to the ground state. So there's a number of processes that it can happen here. One of those processes that can happen with this excitation or this exciton is recombination. So recombination results in heat. So you absorb a photon, you get an excited state, the excited state relaxes and produces heat. So this is not photochemistry or photocatalysis. So that process is one we don't want to happen. The other processes that can happen, I'm going to illustrate this over here. If we look at that diagram again and just put our electron and our hole, I'm going to draw these now near the surface. So Remember, this is a roughly spherical particle. That absorbance process can happen anywhere within that solid material. It's a little bit more likely close to the surface because the photons aren't going to penetrate necessarily all the way. They'll get absorbed before they get to the core. It depends on the size of the particle. But if these are formed not at the surface, they can't react. They have to get to the surface. So there's a migration process that happens for these to get to the surface. But once they get to the surface, if you're in an aqueous system exposed to the atmosphere, there are two reactions that we already talked about that can happen here. One is oxygen forming superoxide. Does anybody remember what happens to superoxide after it reacts further in aqueous media? Nobody? You want to look back to your notes from the other day? All right, that's all right, I'll tell you. It gets protonated and then it disproportionates and then it forms, uh, gets in, it takes on another electron and forms hydroxyl radical. Remember, hydroxyl radical is a very highly reactive species and um, it doesn't 
last very long. Basically, the first thing it bumps into, it reacts with, as long as that species is, is oxidizable. And this hole can react with water to form the same species. Now, it's not clear which of these two processes is more, is more predominant. I know of a few studies where they use uh, like 18 labeled O2, and then they look for the oxygen that reacts and decide whether it's 18 labeled or not, and you can differentiate between whether it was an oxygen source or a water source. I don't think the results were completely conclusive. I think there were a couple of studies that did that, and it wasn't 100% clear. But these are the two primary pathways for TiO2 in the presence of light and in the presence of water and oxygen to form hydroxyl radical. This species here is also reactive, the superoxide anion. It's generally a reducing agent. It will transfer that electron to something else, whereas hydroxyl radical is uh, more typically an, a strong oxidizing agent. Now, in addition to those reactions, you can also have an organic species that can take that electron, and then you get the radical anion there, or you can have a, a, an organic species here that reacts with the hole by transferring an electron to that hole and forming the radical cation. Both of these species are also reactive and typically will react further with water or oxygen in order to form products. So you have several possible processes here. You have formation of superoxide, you have formation of hydroxyl radical through reaction with oxygen, you have formation of uh, hydroxyl radical through reaction with water, or you have direct reaction of an easily reduced species or an easily oxidized species directly at the surface. So it gets a little bit complicated because you have multiple processes, and remember, we have those reactions as well, where you have the reactive transients that can either oxidize or reduce organic species that are present in solution. So there are basically four reactions here. Actually, there's more than four. There's several processes here. I'm not going to count them up. You guys can count them up uh, that are possible with the uh, irradiation of TiO2 with wavelengths in the appropriate region. So let's talk about wavelength a little bit. So I'm going to do two plots here. One is absorbance as a function of wavelength. This is for TiO2 anatase, and I'm going to put... I'm just going to put 400 on this graph. And the absorbance spectrum looks something like this. Now, what did I say was the band gap of TiO2? Anybody remember? 388. Well, the, uh, sorry, 3.2 electron volts, but it corresponds to 388 nanometers. Where's 388 nanometers on that graph? It's just about here, right? Well, I didn't give you a good scale, but we can imagine. You notice there's absorbance out past 400 in this graph, but that absorbance is very, very weak. And if you do these band gap calculations, they typically will put a, a slope along that line there, and so we'll call this 388 right here. So even though the band gap corresponds to 388 nanometers, it's possible that there's some photochemistry happening slightly longer wavelengths than 388. Now, let's draw over here the solar spectrum. So this would be flux, and this would be wavelength again. And I'll put 250, 500, 750, and I'll do my best to draw this. Look something like that. It's not the greatest drawing of the solar spectrum, but 400 is about here, 388 is about there, and if you look at this spectrum, 
a very, very small portion of that is overlapping with this absorbance spectrum of TiO2. And in that region where the solar intensity exists, the TiO2 absorbance is getting weaker and weaker and weaker. So one of the disadvantages, in fact, the primary disadvantage of TiO2 as a photocatalyst is that it has poor overlap with the solar spectrum. The reason that's unfortunate is because, well, let's put it this way. How much does sunlight cost? Anybody? Does it cost anything? It depends if you have to go to the beach to get it. It depends, yes, that is a correct answer. In general, sunlight is free. If you want to concentrate that sunlight using a lot of mirrors, then you have to pay some money for the mirrors and all that. But sunlight is very, very cheap. And so this is unfortunate because if there were a better overlap between the solar spectrum and TiO2, we could do all kinds of photocatalysis for waste stream remediation, for environmental systems, or even for synthetic chemistry under certain conditions. Unfortunately, that overlap is not good, and therefore the use of TiO2 in ambient lighting conditions is not very effective. You can use lamps to create UV radiation. For example, uh, mercury, is it 366? I can't, I used to know that number. Do you remember the mercury vapor lamp lines? There's one around 360, something like that, for a mercury vapor lamp. So you can easily produce UV radiation that is a really, really strong overlap with TiO2. But what does it cost to create light with a mercury vapor lamp? Well, you have to have electricity to generate that electricity. So it's no longer free if you're using your own light source. So that's a major drawback to TiO2. However, there are a number of advantages for TiO2. The first one is it's extremely stable. It's very, very difficult to destroy titanium dioxide. In fact, if you want to do measurements of titanium, if you want to quantitate titanium and titanium dioxide, it, you have to go to extreme measures to digest it. It's not easy at all to uh, break it apart. So that's really, really good. It's essentially non-toxic partly because it's stability, it doesn't react. Things that don't react are usually not very toxic. So that's a really, really good advantage. It's relatively inexpensive. It's relatively abundant. And is that it? Oh, one more thing. It does. Compared to a number of other potential photocatalyst materials, it has a relatively long exciton lifetime. So why is that important? Well, I erased it over here, but if we go TiO2 plus a photon gives us an electron and a hole, what are the two possibilities that I mentioned? One was reaction at the surface, either for the hole or the electron. What was the other possibility? recombination, right? So the, f the shorter this lifetime is, the lower that quantum efficiency. Remember we talked about quantum efficiency the other day? So long exciton lifetimes means good quantum efficiencies, short lifetimes mean poor quantum efficiencies. And it's, it's not exactly a long lifetime, it's just compared to many other materials that are semiconductors that could be used as photocatalysts. TiO2 has a relatively high lifetime. So it probably makes TiO2 the most studied material as a potential photocatalyst for either sunlight use or um, artificial light.
So let's talk a little bit about the processes that have to happen for these reactions to occur. Obviously, we have to have sun, uh, sorry, absorbance of a photon first. That's the first step of any photoreaction. But after that process, I'm going to focus on the reaction of a species in solution directly at the surface. And then we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit about those other processes. So in order for this process to happen, that molecule that's going to react has to uh, diffuse to the surface. So you've got diffusion to the surface. You've got adsorption. It has to stick onto the surface generally in order to react. Then reaction can occur. Obviously, this has to be coincident with absorbance of a photon uh, close, either close to the time of adsorption or after adsorption so that electron or hole will be present and able to react. The next step is then desorption. So the products of the reaction have to come off the surface. And then you have another diffusion step where the products will diffuse away from the surface. So all of these steps are important in the kinetics, especially the adsorption and the desorption, because if it takes a long time for your species to adsorb, it can't react until it adsorbs. And if the product sticks to the surface and doesn't desorb readily, that means a new reactant can't come in to react. So these steps are really, really important. And of course, the diffusion is also important because you have to get the species to the surface. Diffusion away from the surface isn't usually as important because that doesn't block diffusion of the reactant to the surface. Now, if we're talking about these other species here, the reactive transients, then the kinetics are going to be a little bit different because essentially what we have to have is diffusion of the transient away from the surface and then reaction in solution. So if we talk about solution phase reactions, we can just write a, a second order kinetic model where the rate is going to be equal to the second order rate constant times the concentration of the reactant times the concentration of hydroxyl radical. The higher the hydroxyl radical concentration is, the faster the rate. Uh, and of course, the concentration of hydroxyl radical is dependent on the rate of photon absorbance as well as the ability of this process to happen. But typically, more photons means a higher concentration of hydroxyl radical. Okay, so for this type of indirect reaction, the kinetics are typically going to be controlled by the flux. And remember, this is wavelength dependent because if we're using 500 nanometer light, there's no reaction whatsoever. If we're using 400 nanometer light, there are a few photons absorbed. If we're using 350 nanometer light electromagnetic radiation, there's a lot of photons absorbed because the, the um, TiO2 absorbs strongly in that region. Okay, so for these indirect mechanisms, typically we're going to talk about homoge homogeneous second order kinetics, keeping in mind that the concentration of the radical is going to be proportional to the flux of photons. For the heterogeneous reactions where the reactant that we're looking at is actually coming directly onto the surface, those kinetics are going to be similar to typical catalyst, heterogeneous catalyst kinetics where you have all these steps. And of course you have to couple that with the um, absorbance of photons. So in either case, the rate is going to be dependent on the flux of photons. So let's just kind of take a look 
at the surface. This is not going to be a very good model for titanium dioxide, but just pretend. So if you have this lattice of TiO species, what happens when you get to the edge of the particle? So I've got the drawing up here. What happens to the, the repeating matrix of TiO in the crystal structure? Can it exist at the surface? There's an edge there, right? So what has to happen? It has to stop. So where are you going to stop? I can just keep drawing Ti's and O's, right? What happens at the edge? Do I have Ti or O at the surface? Well, typically, you're going to have two things at the surface of most, um, and I'll just sort of cheat. These are the, the typical terminating groups that you have on the surface of metal oxide solids. There, you have defects. There's all kinds of other things that can happen here. It depends on the, 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 how it ends. But OH groups are going to be very common, and sometimes you'll have these bridging oxygen groups. But let's just focus on this OH group. Because what do we know about the OH bond? What kind of bond is that? Is that an ionic bond, a covalent bond, a nonpolar covalent bond, or a polar covalent bond? It's a polar covalent bond, right? And what happens to polar covalent bonds under the right conditions? They can break apart like an ionic bond does. So this OH group on the surface can dissociate. Under what types of conditions will that tend to happen, where you lose a proton? What favors loss of a proton from an acid group? What's the, what's the reactant that H plus reacts with readily? It's very simple chemistry. A base. a base, right? So if you have OH minus, that's going to favor the equilibrium to go to the right. So the higher the pH, the more negative the surface charge will become. What about the other reaction? You can also protonate that species. So if you go to low pH, you end up having positive surface charge. So what's going to happen now if I have a reactant that's positively charged? Is pH going to have any effect on that reactant? If I go to high pH, what's that positive reagent going to do? It's going to be attracted to the surface, right? And if I go to low pH, it's going to be repelled by the surface. So the kinetics, the surface state, or the kinetics are highly dependent on the pH for TiO2 and pretty much any other metal oxide system. And what we can talk about is the point of zero charge. This is the pH at which the surface has a net zero charge. It doesn't mean it's all neutral. It just means that the negatives and the positives are present in equal amount as well as the neutrals. So that's the point of zero charge. And for TiO2, it's, uh, I think it's 6, yeah, 6.5. So if you go one pH unit below 6.5, down to 5.5, you're going to have a substantial positive charge on the surface. If you go one pH unit above to 7.5, you're going to have a substantial negative charge on the surface. And these are extremely important, not only because the reagent, sorry, the reactant might be charged, positive or negative, but even if it's not charged, if it's polar, that's going to impact its ability to absorb. If, it ha if it's got a positive on one side and a negative on the other side, once you get these groups, that's going to change the adsorption of those polar species. In addition to that, there are other species that might be present, like chloride or nitrate or phosphate. What's going to happen to these species 
if you go to a, a pH that puts a positive charge on the surface. Those are going to stick to the surface and that can change dramatically the photochemistry because it can either block adsorption of your analyte, it can block access of your O2 or your water, or it can um, react. Well, chloride, uh, typically these things are not going to react, but if you have some other species like organic acids that might be um, negative in solution, it gets a little tricky because you've got a, a, a pH situation with the uh, organic acids. But you may have something that's reactive that might adsorb on the surface that's not the species that you're trying to get to react and that can block the chemistry. Okay, so there's a, a lot of complexity on the surface and that complexity is actually highly pH dependent. So if you ever do experiments with titanium dioxide, you might want to think about what is the pH because if your pH is changing during that experiment, that can change the kinetics of the reaction. So we were talking about rate and I took a little bit of an aside to talk about uh, surface states because that is important in controlling the kinetics. So the rate for these reactions is typically going to be proportional to the photon flux. I already mentioned that before, but say it again. The rate is also going to be proportional to the concentration of your reactant. Let me put an R there to be consistent with what I did before. But the rate is also going to be proportional to the concentration of the TiO2. But, but this proportionality is a little bit complicated because first of all, it's going to be surface area dependent, as I guess all heterogeneous reactions are. So if you have very, very small TiO2 particles, the rate of photochemistry for those should be much higher than larger particles for the same mass of material, simply because all of these reactions, whether it's direct reaction of the uh, reactant or with oxygen or water, those are all going to be surface area dependent. Okay, so that's one point. And the other point is there's a limitation here if the concentration of TiO2 gets so high that it interferes with absorbance. And I'll explain that in a simple diagram. So absorbance is a logarithmic process simply because there's a specific probability of absorbance in any given volume. And once you go to the next volume, that same probability exists. So you, for example, if the probability is 10% in the first volume, it's 10% in the second volume and 10% in the third volume. So you go from 100% of the light to 90% of the light to 81% of the light to 73% uh, of the light. So each time you get less and less light, the probability of absorbance goes down. So if you imagine a container that's filled with particles of TiO2 and let's say there's a stir bar in there to keep them suspended because TiO2, the density of TiO2 is, uh, I don't remember the number, but it's much greater than one. And so these particles will settle over time. However, nanoparticles tend to not settle. Does anybody know why nanoparticles don't settle? Their density is greater than one, so gravity should pull them down. But because they're so small, Every time the water molecules move around, they bump into the TiO2 particles and push them randomly. And so that random motion tends to keep them floating. It's just like, have you ever seen dust floating in the air? Dust is heavier than air. Why doesn't it fall to the ground? Because every time the wind blows, it gets pushed back up and then it starts to settle and then the wind blows and it gets pushed back up. Same thing happens with nanoparticles. Okay, so let's take light intensity uh, let's just use I for light intensity on this axis. 
And so if we have light intensity coming in, it's gonna be constant. When it hits the surface of this container and starts to get into the TiO2, it's gonna decrease. And that decrease is gonna be a logarithmic decrease as a function of distance through the solution. If the TiO2 solution is great enough, all of the light will get absorbed before that light can go through the entire solution. And what happens to this part of the solution? How much light is in that part of the solution or suspension? None, because the light is all gone. So if you increase, and in fact here, there's very, very little light. So essentially in this example, about two thirds of that solution is in, in darkness and about one third of it is having a varying amount of light intensity. So as you increase the TiO2 concentration, if you make it too high, you actually decrease the rate of photochemistry because you're only using a small portion of your solution. Now, if you're stirring it, you can make up for that to some extent, but you just have to keep in mind that when this solution becomes, or the suspension becomes opaque, then the photon flux can actually uh, be limited because all the light it gets absorbed and so the extra TiO2 in here doesn't do any good. So uh, these are some uh, equations for heterogeneous catalysis and it turns out it's dependent on a number of factors. If you're at low concentration of your reactant, I guess I'll use R because that's what I've been using the rate is now uh, K1 times K2 times the concentration of the reactant times uh, the number of sites or the concentration of sites. So let me define the K values. So if you have the reactant plus um, the uh, sensitizer, so the TiO2 is going to be the sensitizer, so let me just do it as TiO2. You're going to have uh, a rate constant for forming adsorption on that surface. So that's what that K1 is, is the adsorption, and K2 is then once you have it on the surface, then you're going to react to form products. Again, this is generic for catalysis, heterogeneous catalysis, but you can apply it to the photocatalysis piece. And so you got these two rate constants, the concentration of your species and the number of surface sites or the, the concentration of surface sites. That's at low uh, concentration of substrate. And this is essentially first order kinetics in terms of your reactant, because you see the reactant is there one time with an exponent of one. So it's essentially, and the, the number of sites is fixed. So this is essentially first order kinetics. But if you go to high concentration of your species, then the rate becomes dependent on the number of surface sites. Because essentially what happens is you saturate all the surface sites and now nothing can absorb anymore. And so you have to wait, I erased it, but you have to wait till that, for that reaction to happen and then something to desorb before something else can come and attach. And this, what's the rate of this in, with respect to the reactant or the order of it res, with respect to the reactant? Now this is zero order. So the photocatalysis is this, it's a little bit more complicated because you have to add the, the concentration of photons in there, but this is the, the general equations for heterogeneous catalysis. And so you can go in first order or, or zero order depending on the concentration of your species. And like I said earlier, if you're in a situation like this, you can be uh, absorbing all the photons and now you end up being photon limited. The reaction can't go any faster because all the photons are being used. Okay, so you have that added complication in photocatalysis. All right, so let me just 
see what time it is. Okay. So, yeah, I know, but I, it's all right. I can, I, I don't want to, I don't want to be here too long, so. All right, so let's just change topics a little bit and talk a little bit about the types of applications. And then we're going to shift to a few diagrams with the PowerPoint slide. So I didn't want to give this huge long list of specific examples because it gets a little bit boring. But I'm just going to give a few examples, generic examples, of applications that TIO2 has been used for. So pesticides are very commonly uh, degraded by TiO2 or other techniques. Dyes. So we all wear, you know, clothing. This purple shirt, the the fabric that was used to make this shirt had to be dyed. And when they do dyeing, only part of the dye sticks to the fabric, and the rest of the dye washes off and it gets dumped into a river. Have you guys heard of that before? If you go where the textile mills are, you can see the colored water coming out. Uh, but depending on what the dye is, sometimes they're not allowed to do that, so they need to degrade that. So they can use TiO2 uh, photocatalysis to get rid of it. There's a lot of work that's being done these days on antibiotics, because if you go to any wastewater treatment plan, it turns out that a lot of the antibiotics aren't degraded by the microorganisms. Because what do we use the antibiotics to do? To kill the microorganisms, right? So they typically aren't capable of degrading these. And so people are concerned about after the wastewater treatment plant, the river now is filled with antibiotics. And so people are talking about using titanium dioxide to um, to do that. Uh, chemical warfare agents can be degraded by titanium dioxide. It's similar, uh, a lot of them have similar structures to some types of pesticides. Organophosphate pesticides have a lot of overlap with these chemical warfare agent structures. Another one that I think is a really interesting application is agricultural waste. So the one example that I'll give is in Central and South America. What do you guys um, drink a lot of in France? I don't know, maybe you guys don't. What do people drink a lot of in France that's grown in South America? Coffee. Well, you might not know this, but there's a lot of waste that comes from coffee farms. They go and they collect the beans, and then they, I don't know exactly what they do with them, they process them partially. And there's waste products from that process. And you might think, oh, it's just coffee, what does it matter? But it turns out, anytime you put a high concentration into a river or a stream, you potentially impact that environment. And it turns out that there's a big problem with this because when you go to South America, where these coffee farms are, they don't have a lot of facilities to treat waste. So there's a lot of discussion and a lot of research going on in, in Central America where they'll, you know, we have the sun up here, and they'll have a panel here where water will come in here. The water will circulate back and forth like this through either a, uh, what they call a fluidized bed which just means that the liquid flows through the particles of TiO2 and that keeps the TiO2 particles suspended, but the particles don't get out because there's a little filter at the end that keeps them from getting out, or they'll um, coat the T TiO2 on the glass. So they have glass tubes that are here, and this glass tube will have TiO2 coated on the inside surface so that the sunlight comes in, gets absorbed by the TiO2, the waste goes through the middle and gets degraded by the hydroxyl radical or other species that are being um, created. And then 
that water is then discharged often not directly to a river but to a uh, to an engineered wetland. I'm not sure if that's the word they use for it. Uh, because the, a lot of these wetlands have a lot of bacteria and microorganisms that are really, really good at degrading pollutants, but they can't do the, hard, the high loading that comes in here. So if you partially oxidize them, then they become more easily degraded by the biological system. Constructed, that's the term that, sorry, it's really the same idea. They call it a constructed wetland, so they plant the right kind of plants there. So this is actually being done in uh, certain locations in South America because it's relatively cheap and it uses sunlight in order to treat the waste. And then the, the small farmers don't have to pack up their wastewater and ship it off to pay a lot of money to get it treated. Okay, I have one more that I'm gonna put up here and then we'll move on. The next one is called water splitting. Have you guys heard of water splitting before? Anybody? It's a really big topic nowadays. So, so this is water splitting. You take two water molecules, you add photons, and now you get two hydrogen molecules and two oxygen molecules. Oh, sorry, one oxygen molecule. Hopefully I did that right, four, yeah. Why would we want to do this? Do we not have enough oxygen on the planet to breathe? Can everybody take a deep breath? Can you get enough oxygen? Yeah. So we don't care about the oxygen. What do we care about? Hydrogen. Why do we care about hydrogen? Because we turn this right back around. And we get a huge amount of energy out of that. This is a very, very exothermic reaction. And actually, the efficiency is greatest when you do it in a, a fuel cell. So you electrochemically do this reaction rather than just burning them because you can have a higher efficiency of capturing the energy in that process. Then uh, it tur turns out it's hard to convert heat into electricity. It's not a very efficient process. So if you can split water with sunlight and then gather up that hydrogen and then use a fuel cell to then get electricity back out. You can drive your car, you can run your lights, you can do anything you want. Uh, you can actually even convert, you could take this energy to take carbon dioxide and convert it things like ethanol, which now we can have a liquid fuel that we can put in our cars or our airplanes. So this is a, a, would be great if we could do it, Unfortunately, the efficiency of this process is really, really low. But it always uses a photocatalyst. So there's a huge amount of work being done on photocatalysts for water splitting, simply because it would be such a great source of energy, Con converting energy from the sun to reusable, storable, transportable forms of energy. Uh, unfortunately, it's really, really hard to do this. Uh, this reaction is uh, 1.23 volts, which is a pretty high amount of energy, but it turns out that it's not that amount of energy that causes it to be difficult. It's because there's a kinetic barrier. The release of oxygen from the water molecules is uh, kinetically very, very slow. So there's this thing called overpotential, which means instead of having to apply 1.23 volts, you have to apply about two or two and a half volts. And that extra energy that you have to apply makes it a less efficient process and very, very hard to do. Now this comes back to the comment that I made earlier. We call this a photocatalyst, but the definition of a catalyst is something that enhances the rate of a reaction. But what are we doing here? Are we enhancing a rate here? We're going energetically unfavorably. So there's a little bit of confusion with the terminology in photochemistry. This is not just photocatalysis. This is driving a reaction in, in an unfavorable direction. So, but we do need catalysts because like I said, there's a kinetic barrier there as well.
The catalyst allows you to operate hopefully close to 1.23 volts, but you're also putting in that 1.23 volts from your photons to drive the reaction in the reverse direction. Well, you, we, you used it. There's two different catalysts, actually, that are typically used. You use one catalyst for oxygen evolution and one catalyst for hydrogen evolution, and you do those in separate locations. Oh, well, it's best to do it in separate locations. What happens if you do it in the same place? You get an explosion, or, you know, often you can have potential for an explosion. So typically... Uh, you... Yeah, typically, I don't remember the details of these cells, but typically you're going to use a, a palladium catalyst in one, and I don't remember the catalyst in the other. It turns out the hydrogen part is easy. It's super easy to, to hydrolyze hydrogen. It's the oxygen evolution reaction that's really, really difficult. And a lot of people will do what they call sacrificial, um, I forget the word for it, sacrificial, um, well, I, f I can't think of the word for it. And so instead of evolving oxygen, you're going to oxidize something else. Well, that's great, except where do you get that something else? Usually it's ethanol. Where do you get the ethanol from? Well, you, you convert petroleum into ethanol, and now you're right back where we started from, using petroleum and non-renewable resources as our feedstocks. So anyway, it's a really, really big field. And... Uh, so let's, now that I mentioned a few of these examples, um, I think maybe it's time for me to put my slides up because the slides talk about some of these things. And if I need the board again, we'll just come back to it. Oh, titanium dioxide is extensively used as, in, as a pigment in paint but it's mostly rutile that's used in paint pigments. And if I remember this correctly, I think rutile is more thermodynamically stable than, t uh, than anatase. So... Was it used in paints because it's a photocatalyst, or did they use it in paints first to find out the paints... Originally, it was used in paint as a pigment in paint, not just in paint, it's used in foods, in sunscreens, it's used in a wide range of white objects. And originally, it was just because it's very stable and it's very white. M much. It's, it's I, white it's a well, it, 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 it's really white because it scatters light. It doesn't absorb efficiently in the visible, and so you get these little particles and they scatter light, and that's what we perceive as white. Scattered light is white if it's full spectrum. If you go to uh, you know lead pigments. You get these red colors, for example, and the red is because the, the lead oxide or whatever material it is absorbs uh, green light, and that gives it a, the, the absence of green light in, in the full spectrum gives our eye and our brain the appearance of red. But I think much later than its use as a pigment, TiO2 was discovered to be a good photocatalyst. And actually, like I said, it's anatase is the better photocatalyst. Rutile is the common pigment. And if you go uh, in certain parts of Asia, they're actually painting sidewalks with anatase because it, it's a self-cleaning sidewalk. You can paint a car, you can paint the side of a building. And in fact, if you go in bathrooms, indoor if you've got there's plenty of uv that comes out of these uh, fluorescent bulbs so if you paint the bathroom with anatase well then the bathroom doesn't smell as bad because it oxidizes all of the stinky stuff that's in the room i don't think they're very efficient because they don't they only work in the uv but there are people doing this mainly in asia uh, not so much in europe and, and in the u.s yeah yeah. Yeah, and even cars, you know, you can think about painting your car with, you know, self, you know, photocatalyst and that way you don't have to wash it ever. Lots of things could be white. Yeah. That's why they don't Personally, I don't like to wash my car because it's, you know, it wastes my time, my money, and it utilizes resources. It's, I'm environmentally conscious. I don't want to use water and waste it and all that soap. <laughs> 
No, it's really because I'm just kind of lazy. Okay. Let's see if I can, maybe if I turn this on, it'll work. No? All right, well, that works. Okay, so, oh, look, water splitting. We were talking about this. So this is uh, a band gap, valence band, conduction band. And uh, if you excite this electron up here, that's at a more negative potential than zero, you can reduce H plus to H2. And here you can oxidize H2O to O2 if you're more positive than 1.23 volts. So you notice in this diagram, that band gap is bigger than the energy needed to split water, both the reduction and the oxidation side. And by the way, most of photocatalysis with TiO2 is actually redox chemistry, and you can't have a reduction without a, an oxidation. So if, if you look at the diagram here, you form this electron hole pair. If you lose that electron, now you've got a positively charged material. In order to get back to the original state, you have to gain an electron there. So it has to happen on both sides. Reduction on this side, reduction of the substrate on this side, oxidation of the substrate on this side to replenish the electrons that are moving. Like I mentioned though, this band gap, sorry, this energy gap of 1.23 volts, you actually need a lot larger potential than that because there's a kinetic barrier mostly on this side and that kinetic barrier is overcome by adding extra energy. So let's just look at a bunch of um, oxide materials, uh, semiconductor materials. Here's TiO2 right there. And you see this is an energy diagram. Zero is the H2, H plus. That's the uh, standard hydrogen electrode was just decided a long time ago. I don't know why they picked such a difficult system to work with. It's explosive. You gotta have pH of, uh, you have to have one molar H plus in there, which is very um, reactive as well. But anyway, somebody picked that a long time ago. That's our arbitrary zero. And you can see that the TiO2 band gap actually has a higher, uh, more negative potential than the hydrogen couple and a more positive uh, potential than the oxygen side. So theoretically, TiO2 should be able to split water. The problem again is if you can't use sunlight, you now have to generate electricity to run your light. And so you're going to lose in that system. If you look at some of these other species, uh, zircon zirconium oxide is having a huge band gap that does not absorb even in the UV region, I don't think. Uh, you can look at some of these others, uh, zinc sulfide, cadmium sulfide, cadmium selenide. And what you'll notice is when these band gaps get a little bit smaller, see 1.7, 1.1, again 1.7, they no longer span a high enough energy gap to drive the water splitting reaction. So TiO2 has the advantage that it has a really wide band gap, wide enough to theoretically split water, but because it's such a wide band gap, it doesn't absorb sunlight. Now you go to something like cadmium selenide, which does absorb in the solar spectrum, but look, you no longer have enough energy to drive both sides of that reaction. So you've got this dilemma. The wide band gap uh, semiconductors have enough energy in their excited state to drive the reaction, but they don't absorb sunlight. The narrow band gap species absorb sunlight, but they don't have a big enough band gap to drive the reaction. So there's not really a simple solution to this problem. And normally what people do is they'll couple something like TiO2 with something like cadmium selenide to try to get the advantages of both. Uh, you'll notice iron oxide is here as well. That's rust, really, really cheap stuff. The problem, there's two problems. One is, again, it's band gap is not sufficient to drive both of these reactions. The other is, um, it has a very, very short exciton lifetime. So when you excite it, it recombines very, very rapidly and you don't get any reaction. Okay, so here's, uh, here's an example of coupling two different 
semiconducting materials to try it and, and do this process. So the uh, FITIO3 is a titanate, iron titanate. It's pretty easy to make that. Low uh, cost materials, earth abundant materials, relatively non-toxic. Its band gap is uh, 2.6 I don't know, those numbers don't make sense. Anyway, it has a narrower band gap than uh, TiO2, but it can inject a hole in the TiO2. So now you can excite this invisible light and transfer one of the reactive species to something that has a different band gap. I have got another one that's a little bit clearer to see. Here, this is using TiO2 and a, a zinc uh, ferrite. Again, these are earth abundant materials, cheap and non-toxic. Notice this band gap is much smaller than this band gap. So this material absorbs visible light. So the idea here is you use visible light to excite the electron. And because the conduction band of the zinc ferrite is at higher energy than the TiO2 valence band, sorry, conduction band, that electron will then be injected in the conduction band of the TiO2. Remember, TiO2 has a relatively long lifetime for that excited electron, and now O2 can react to make superoxide, and that goes on to make hydroxyl radical. So now you have visible light sensitized hydroxyl radical formation by coupling these two species together. Uh, this diagram shows the water oxidation, except they use OH minus, still basically water, basic water, I guess we could say. And now you have the, uh, the um, oxidation step happening where the hole is left behind. Okay, so supposedly this works. The problem is you lose here. Notice you're dropping energy there. So you have less of a driving force to, to do oxidation and reduction. Plus, kinetically, there's a barrier there. Plus, at the interface, you can have recombination. So there's all kinds of barriers that come in your way, even though theoretically it's a great idea. And here, uh, I'm not sure how good the zig ferrite is at doing this reaction. Oftentimes, these surfaces of semiconductors are not very good surfaces for an, uh, electron or hole transfer. And so the kinetics of this reaction can be very, very slow. And again, this was our valence band for TiO2. Look at how much higher that is compared to the TiO2. Now you have to go backwards with holes, with electrons going up as high energy, with holes going down as high energy. So we're going from a high energy hole to a low energy hole. So we lose a lot of the driving force by moving to this type of a system. It can work under some circumstances, but there's a lot of barriers. This is just another example. Now they're using three different semiconductors, uh, zinc ferrite, zinc oxide, and uh, iron oxide. And the idea, again, is that this is a visible light absorber. And once you get this excited electron, it can go downhill to these excited states. And then this species can transfer the electron there. And supposedly, that species can react with the hole. OK, so there's lots and lots of examples. Um, most of them don't work very well, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, the next one I wanted to show you is a uh, very different system. This is not a semiconductor system. This is an organic system. They start with melamine and some other species, and they make this supramolecular complex. And then they heat that, and this condenses to make a uh, graphitic carbon nitride. So this has a lot of the uh, properties of graphite. It uh, uh, conducts quite readily. It also absorbs in the visible. And the electrons from this species, the excited state electrons from this species, can react with O2 to make superoxide. And that then produces hydroxyl radical. You can also get singlet oxygen sensitization because the excited states can react with uh, triplet oxygen to make singlet oxygen. And I think I have uh, one more example. This species is called a disensitized solar cell. It was developed. I think it was in the 1980s by a guy named Gretzel, who's from Switzerland, or at least he lives in Switzerland, works there. I don't know if he's actually from Switzerland originally. And in this particular system, they use TiO2, but they put a dye on there, 
And then they put a redox coupling agent, which was typically iodine or an iodine species. And the way this works is the ruthenium dye that they use absorbs in the visible and injects an electron into the titanium dioxide. And that electron that's injected in the titanium dioxide then is transferred through that redox couple to the other electrode. And now you've got electron injection on the one side, the electron comes back to the other side and then shuttles through the redox couple back to, because you obviously you have to reduce this oxidized dye back, otherwise it degrades. Okay, so this is called a dye sensitized solar cell. And the reason I wanted to point this one out is because now we're using organic sensitizers. The others that I showed you, they were using zinc ferrite or, or uh, iron titanate as the, the inorganic sensitizers, but you can also do organic sensitizers. The problem with the organic sensitizers, if you don't have this redox couple there, these things oxidize quite rapidly and then they get destroyed. Okay, so there's one other thing that I wanted to mention. I'm going to use the board for this and then we'll wrap it up. And that's a system in which uh, TiO2 or any other semiconductor material is used. Again, you've got the valence band and the conduction band and you add a photon, you get this whole electron pair. What you can do with these systems, instead of doping the surface of this with another semiconductor material, you can actually put a metal on the surface, like gold. And the reason that you would want to put a metal on the surface is because metals are very, very good at collecting electrons. So if you want to prevent that electron and that hole from recombining, moving it out of the semiconductor is a great way to do it. So theoretically, this metal nanoparticle on the surface of this TiO2 nanoparticle extends the exciton lifetime by separating the electron and the hole. The other advantage is that metals are much better surfaces for electron transfer. So if you want to do a reduction at the surface of that metal, you've got all those electrons captured there, and that can much more easily directly transfer that electron to reduce, either through a radical or a two-electron reduction of a substrate. And then, of course, the hole can be involved in, in an oxidation reaction to balance the electrons. So a lot of people have studied this kind of system as well. And I have mixed feelings about whether this actually works or not. There's a lot of papers that say it does, but I've done it a number of times in my lab and we've not had good success. I think it really has to do with the loading of the metal because if you put too much metal on the surface, you block the light and now you can't absorb anymore. The other potential advantage is metal nanoparticles have what's called a surface plasmon resonance and they actually absorb, gold absorbs around 550 to make a red color. So if you go to any of the old churches in town and you see the red stained glass, it's actually gold nanoparticles in there that are absorbing uh, the green light to appear red. It's a very uh, deep red color. So that surface plasmon supposedly can be excited and then cause an electron to go the other direction. In addition to the surface plasmon, nanoparticles, metal nanoparticles scatter light. And so if you scatter the light, you can actually increase the intensity of the light and enhance the absorbance by the oxide material. Okay, so that's a whole bunch of uh, little examples of types of uh, materials used for photocatalysis. And I'll end by thanking again the region for support. And I didn't let you guys ask questions along that long, lengthy discussion, so I guess we can have a few now. Yes? Um, in normal catalysis, uh, the catalyst uh, decreases activation energy, or it can change the general mechanism. Yes. Uh, what I understood is uh, catalysis is just like a source of energy. Okay, so the question, I have to repeat the question for the, the non-present audience. The question is, in, in catalysis, normally we think of the increased rate uh, a, a product of decreasing the activation energy or providing a different mechanism which has a lower activation barrier. 
And the question is, in photocatalysis, does that happen or is it just adding energy? And the answer is, I think both mechanisms can happen. You can have a situation where you add a photon and that photon helps overcome the activation barrier. For example, uh, we talked about the, the homogeneous photocatalysis catalysis with uh, singlet oxygen. That's, I think, just an energy mechanism. But when you adsorb a surface, sorry, when you adsorb a reactive species, potentially reactive species on the surface, that changes the conformation of that species. And if you co-adsorb something else on that surface, you can facilitate a different mechanism. So in photocatalysis, you can have both of those mechanisms happening. You can have simple energy barrier uh, processes where your photon is just overcoming the energy barrier, or you can have different conformations or proximity of reactants and therefore lower the activation barrier or cause different mechanisms to be possible. And then there's a third possibility, which I mentioned a few times, you could actually drive unfavorable reactions by using that photon to push the reaction in the opposite direction, which generally you're not going to see in non-photocatalysis. Simple catalysis, you don't see that process happening. Okay. Well, when you're doing photocatalysis, normally you're in a system that's at a, either a fixed pH or the pH may change over time because of your products. So if you're producing acid species, which is quite common, your pH be can become acidic during the course of the experiment. Normally, though, you're at a given pH, so that adsorption-desorption step is always going to be at a fixed pH. So typically what you would do is adjust the pH to optimize the kinetics of the process and then just leave it at that pH and then rely on the whatever the adsorption desorption kinetics are under those conditions hopefully are most favorable for that reaction. Sorry I forgot to repeat the question it was about uh, can you adjust the pH to facilitate adsorption and desorption during the photocatalysis. Okay anything else? Okay, no, I one more. Question. Um, so for, you said, you, know, you mentioned that if you reduce the, if you reduce something from an electron, you have to oxidize something to get to like a charge. Now the other possibility on the surface is you could lose a surface photon. And so time is going to accumulate holes and, add, and negative charges on the surface. And the question is, will that progressively, what would be the effect on the band gap once you start accumulating okay. a certain number of those? So the, the question is, is it possible to uh, accumulate surface charge through loss of uh, protons? And will that surface charge accumulate? Did I get that right? Yeah. Okay, so typically if you've got a good photocatalyst, a, a good heterogeneous photocatalyst, it is not going to be reactive. So generally what you're looking at is not doing that type of process. You're going to have an electron react on the one side and then the electron come back on the other side to, to balance and then you excite again. Now it is possible to have accumulation of charge especially when you're talking about systems like this where you have a metal surface that's going to be a good reservoir for those electrons. But if you think about that, the first electron you put on there goes easily. The second electron, it's not as easy, right? By the time you get to the 10,000th electron, maybe you saturated this species and you've started to accumulate charge. And that actually makes it more difficult for this electron to come out. And yes, you can change the surface energy, or sorry, the, the band energies of your uh, photocatalyst material or semiconductor material. I'm not very good at drawing these, but the bands actually bend at the surface. So if you have a metal semiconductor interface, and I, I don't know if I drew these up, sometimes they bend up, sometimes they bend down. It depends on the, the energies. 
Uh, it turns out, though, anytime you put something in contact with the semiconductor material, you actually bend the bands at the edge. And so now your photochemistry is different because you're not looking at this necessarily. You may be looking at that. And now while that energy, the band gap is the same, the absolute energies are different. And the absolute energies are very different in controlling the electron and the whole reactions at the surface. So even though I don't think you get this, um, w at least with TiO2, I don't think you're going to see that kind of process where you're losing protons from the surface, but you can, in many cases, have charge buildup, and that charge buildup will actually prevent further reaction. Yeah, I can't. I haven't read that paper in a really long time. I just remember that there were some uncertainties in the experiment, and they couldn't 100% decide. And by the way, um, hydroxyl radical, there's a lot of debate over whether hydroxyl radical actually exists in a lot of these systems because you can get these high valent metal systems. For example, iron, iron 6, you can form in, not, obviously not in a TiO2, but in an iron containing system. You may be making these very high valent iron species, iron oxygen species, and not actually hydroxyl radical. And the kinetics for their reaction are supposedly similar and the products are similar. So it can be very difficult to dif differentiate between these high metal, high valent metals and hydroxyl radical itself. I don't know if that's true in the TiO2 systems or not, but it's something else to consider. Okay. Thank uh, Matthew again for the whole series of talks. Really really very different from what we've seen in the rest of the course. So that okay, good. All right, well, I don't know about you guys, but I'm hungry. And for those of you who aren't eating until sunset, sorry. You have to wait a few more hours yet. <laughs>